Welcome to Clear Eyes, Full Hearts, a podcast presentation of Cadence 13 in association with Black Barrel Media and Ritual Productions. This is an episode-by-episode look at the award-winning TV show Friday Night Lights created by Peter Berg. I'm Stacey Orstano. I played Mindy Collette Riggins. And I'm Derek Phillips, and I played Billy Riggins. The assumption is, as always, that you, our listeners, have already watched the show. But if you haven't already, go watch Friday Night Lights, which is currently streaming on Netflix and Peacock TV because there will be spoilers in our podcast. And check out the merch. That's right, baby. Go check out our website designed by Eleanor Carez, who is at Eleanor Carez on Instagram. Our website is www.cleareyesfullheartspod.com. That's cleareyesfullheartspod.com. And we still want to answer your fan questions. Email us anything you want to know at cleareyesfullheartspod at gmail.com today. Season three, episode three, How the Other Half Lives. It was written by Patrick Massett, directed by Dean White, and the NBC synopsis says, Coach Taylor faces pressure to make changes to the team, and Matt feels the heat as the fans focus on new quarterback J.D. McCoy. And we have a fantastic guest with us today, D.W. Moffat, who plays Joe McCoy. But before we chat with D.W., we're going to discuss this episode's highlights. I would say a highlight of all of season three is that Derek and I do a lot of dancing. Lots and lots and lots. So much dancing. So much dancing. And if you notice in this episode, I think we've talked about this before. There was an episode where Billy was picking up the tab. It's so quick, guys. It's so quick. And so you can probably understand Dean White's frustration with us actors in this scene because Mm -hmm. we were making jokes and laughing and giggling. To be fair, it was kitsch. Yes. Yes. It was Taylor Boston. <laughs> well, I think I said something too at one point. Like Angela is supposed to reach for the check. And I say, if you even think about touching that check, I'll smack you in the neck. And that turned into all kinds of different, I'll punch you in the gizzard. I don't know. It, was, yeah, it, got, it got really bad. idiotic. It got bad. And it was like four o'clock in the morning. And Dean, our director, was like, please, you guys, just say the scene. We couldn't. And as it turns out, he just wound up making it a montage. <laughs> We could not keep it together. No, we could not keep it together. But yes, there's a lot of dancing for Billy and Mindy in this season. We even took dance lessons to learn how to two step. We did. We did. Specifically for another episode coming up later. So just keep an eye out for us dancing for all of season three. Yes. Which isn't Derek's favorite thing to do. Not a big fan of dancing, which is kind of crazy because I seem to have to dance in all the stuff that I book. You make it look good. Okay, yeah. uh, also, Billy, what you cooking up? Seems bad. This seems like a bad guy, but also, how does this guy not know who Tim Riggins is? Tim Riggins is a character on the show. Tim Riggins doesn't have his own show. I know he's very popular in the city of Dillon, Texas, but whoever this guy is, I can't remember the character's name, but the shady fella, you know whatever shady Billy's people. cooking up, I'm telling you, it's probably not good. It seems not good. Anytime you're doing business at like midnight in a trailer park, probably not good. Also, anytime Tim Riggins questions if what you're doing is good or not, probably not good. Yes. Also, my spidey senses are here. I'm getting some bad feelings from this McCoy family. I agree. I'm still on the fence, though, about Janine Turner, who plays Katie McCoy. I think she might be decent. I might be wrong in that. I honestly can't remember. But I will say that having spent some time in Dallas, Texas, specifically like the Ritzier Highland Park section of Dallas, Texas, Janine Turner is just killing this part as Katie McCoy. I mean, she just mm-hmm. kind of nails the wealthy Texas socialite to a T, don't you think, Stacey? She does. She looks like she should be walking around like the Highland Park Shopping Center yes. with her perfect nails and her perfect bag and her perfect yes. cool off to hair. It's very much a Dallas girl. And did you notice the rock on her finger? Yeah. I mean, that thing is like blinding. Anyway. God, they have a ton of money, apparently. Yes. Lila then says that me and my mom hate her. I find hate to be a strong word, but I don't think Lila Garrity is Colette people. I don't know if she's our people. Hate might be a strong word, but you definitely don't like her. We're not nice. (laughs) No, you're not very nice to her. (laughs) No. And there's going to be a scene with you guys later that's very uncomfortable. (laughs) Very uncomfortable. I'm with Coach. This barbecue seems to have been what I would say is usurped by the McCoys. And I would say for dubious reasons. Yes. Yes. 100%. And I would say that Tammy is wrong, (gasps) Stacy. For the first time in the history of Friday Night Lights. Now, she's been wrong twice now, I think. But yeah, I think Coach is right. Tammy is being played by the McCoys here. And Kyle 
crushes another wonderful snack thing moment in this scene. What was he? I don't remember. What was he snacking? He was eating uh, chips and beans or something. Of course he was. Yeah, you say that Katie Turner seems nice. Katie McCoy. I'm sorry, McCoy, Katie Turner. With niceness, with a level of, I'm doing this for a reason underneath. Yes. She also wants in. You know, in the South, how they go, oh, bless your heart. Bless her heart. It's a little bless her heart. Which basically means like, oh, he's a moron. Oh, you're so stupid and I'm going to do big things to you. Yeah. I mean, yeah. is there a little bit of that to her maybe? I, I mean, so. it's possible. It's possible. We'll see. If I remember correctly, I kind of always remember going, yeah, I kind of feel for her character. Really? Yeah, because she's in this rough situation with Joe as well. Listen, it's all new to me, so we'll find out. Yeah, we'll see. I didn't we shall watch it. see. I question this smash being asked to be regional manager of the Alamo Freeze. He's working behind the counter and now he can be a regional manager. I hear you. It's a little crazy that that would happen. But I will say that he has been working there for three years. He hasn't stolen any money from the Alamo Freeze in at least two years. True. He stopped stealing money. <laughs> he stopped stealing money from the register I two mean, years so ago. I mean, I would think, that's, I would think yeah, he did. That to me is definitely grounds for a promotion. He's still handing out ice cream to pretty girls though. Yes. We never really talked about it, but he is technically a manager there now. I mean, that's why he's got that fancy red tie on and not wearing the little dinky hat anymore. Is he Matt's boss now? He might be. I think once the injury happened, he just was putting in more hours. Like most kids will have like a part-time job, but Matt can only work so many hours because he's still playing football. Makes sense. But Smash probably was working every day during the summer and all that stuff. Well, Matt's doing two days. Okay. These vows that I recite to you, which by the way, I don't know why I'm telling you my wedding vows before we get married, but it is funny. This was the fourth set of vows that I had to memorize because we had been given the script the week before and it was a Richard Mark song. And then we couldn't get the rights to that. So they decided it would be a Bon Jovi song. Mm -hmm. I memorized that. Couldn't get the rights to that. On the day, it was another thing that I can't remember that was really funny. We didn't get the rights to that. And then finally, I think it was Hudgens handed me, or I guess maybe Patrick, since he wrote this one, handed me the Nemo. And I like right before this scene memorized the Nemo one. And it was funny. So I memorized a lot of vows, but this one was yeah, the so one that Mindy's hit. Yeah, so Mindy's vows are lines from Finding Nemo. And mm-hmm. of course, Lila reacts to it like, isn't that from Finding Nemo? And that is like, so what's wrong with Finding Nemo? And it turns into a little bit of a pissing contest between the two. Yeah, it gets She wants a, to a laugh heated. at my love. Yeah, that's right. She laughed. She, she laughed. laughs at, at our love. This was a fun scene, though. It can get really hairy sometimes when you're shooting a scene when there's like four and five people in it and all of them are talking. One of the things I did love about working with you guys, even when we were messing around at the dinner table, it was still fun and it was still organic. It was just stuff that couldn't be used in the show because we were using language and Dean had to keep telling us to stop. But in this scene, everyone's reacting off everyone perfectly. It's one of the things I love about Friday Night Lights. I go and shoot scenes sometimes now where it's like, if you've got more than two people in the scene, everyone's trying to find their rhythm and what, what's your last line? And oh, okay, that's right. I have to jump on it here. Mm-hmm. And it's like, everyone's talking over everyone. Everyone's just doing their thing. Everyone's in character. And that's why this show works. All of us had been around for three years. So we were so yeah. comfortable with it and comfortable yeah. with what our characters would do. Yeah, you stop thinking. Yeah. You're not thinking anymore. You're just being. We're in that house. It's my house. I'm doing my thing. You're doing your thing. We're all in our own worlds as, as our characters but reacting off of each other. And it's just so freeing. Mindy's a little bit of a bridezilla, I guess. Yes. Billy. Billy, Billy, yes. Billy, 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 Billy. What? Copper wire, stealing. Get a job! You know what? Maybe offer to split the bill with me once in your life, or if you could lower your wedding budget. I think Mindy actually pockets a lot of money, but that's her. She like stashes it under a mattress. She's probably one of these women who's like, I'm going to pocket all this money because I work hard for it, but I still want to be treated. Yeah, she's a good princess. Yeah. So Billy's having to foot the bill every single time they go out. Billy's having to pay for this wedding probably completely and totally out of his pocket. I don't think Mindy's coughing anything up. Mm-mm. Yeah, so he's a ball of stress and he's trying to find a way to pay for this wedding and hold on to this woman that he loves. I get the reasoning behind it, but Billy, come on. Wire. Get it together. Kitch also says in this scene that the copper wire is off of Pence Road. Pence is a good buddy of ours named Josh Pence. 
Josh. So Kitchen was just tossing out a name there. Josh, as you might recognize as the other body of a Winklevoss twin in Social Network, but not the head. Yes. Just one of the bodies of a Winklevoss twin. So now onto the copper wire theft. So the dogs that come chasing after us in this scene, like on paper, this whole entire scene was supposed to be comedic. It read like a Keystone Cops kind of thing. Oh, that's interesting. Not the whole entire scene, but especially like when we break the fence down, like it's supposed to be these guys are like supposed to be pulling the fence to try and break the lock. And then the whole entire fence comes down. It's like, well, that I didn't mean for that to happen. And then the next thing we know, the dogs come rushing out and we're like, yo, zoinks. And that's how we played it. (laughs) It was kind of like a zoinks and jump in the car. But then they put this dramatic music underneath it when they edited the scene and the scene became this really dramatic scene. And it plays better that way, to be honest with you. We probably would have played it a little bit differently as actors if we'd have known that that's how they were going to do it. I don't think I would have jumped through the car window quite so cartoonishly. It needs to be because these stakes are so high. Would they were real dogs that chased after you? Oh, yeah. They were big big Rottweilers. Yeah, they were were, huge. Yeah, they were friendly. (laughs) Fun. I didn't realize copper was such a commodity at the time. I remember talking to you guys. I was like, you're stealing copper. What's that for? Who cares about copper? But it was like a big deal. You know what's crazy is like once every six months, somebody will get busted stealing copper wire. And invariably, this happens across the country, but invariably somebody will send me an article to Somebody getting busted for a copper Those wire. Those darn rigging boys. Going up, looks like the rigging boys are at it again. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> I have to tell you, this McCoy house, it seems so strange to me that this house is in Dillon, but maybe there's this opulent side of Dillon that we just haven't seen yet. That house is huge. You know what, though? I mean, that was something in Texas that I always kind of found fascinating. I went to school in Waco, and I've kind of always thought that Waco is probably about the same size as Dillon. Yeah. Waco may be a little bit bigger. I think Waco had like 100,000 people. Maybe Dillon's more like 60,000 people. When I was in college, we never saw like the rich part of Waco, Texas, because it was all college apartments and stuff like that. Granted, Baylor, where I went to school, there were a lot of kids with a lot of money, but there was also like a very poor side of Waco. Mm-hmm. But then years later, I have a buddy who bought a place in Waco. There are some big ass like mansion houses in that town. There is a massive wealth gap. They do say that this is the biggest house in Dillon. Like This has to be the biggest house in Dillon. And it sticks out like a sore thumb, I'm sure, kind of like McCoy's in this town stick out like a sore thumb. I think I just wonder what is JD's drive time from house to school? Right. We need to get Stacy a map of Dillon. I would love a map of Dillon. And the Dillon subway system, which we've discussed on the show. I would love to see East and West Dillon. I yeah. need to know. We meet Drew Waters for the first time here as Aikman. I forget his first name. Do you remember? Wade Aikman. Wade, yeah. Aikman. Wade Aikman. So we think he's like JD's quarterback coach. He is JD's quarterback coach. Yes, 100%. How did we get the last name Aikman right. past all of producers and NBC? And we've got JD McCoy, who's very loosely based off of Colt McCoy, who was the actual quarterback at the University of Texas while we were shooting the show, who had just taken University of Texas to the national championship game, which they lost to Alabama. But anyway, there's a lot of Texas names that they're pulling from here. Maybe Wade Aikman is Troy's brother. I always thought that because, listen, they also have that chiseled face, blue-eyed, blonde hair. And I was like, are you going for it? Because they could totally be related. It's not a very common name either. In fact, I don't know that I know of any other Aikmans besides Troy I don't think there are any others. Yeah. That's why I I was always like, is that a little on the nose? Maybe a little too on the nose. Yeah. DW, who we're going to talk to later in this episode, does this calm sinister so well? Like it's sinister, but it's underplayed and it makes it maybe even eerier. There's a little grin that he has on his face all the time. You know what yeah, I mean? Like a perma smirk. Mm-hmm. He like he knows more than everybody else in yes. the room. Yes. Yes. <sighs> and that it's just a big chessboard. He's a master. You know? These lines hit me in my gut. Mm. Coach says, I miss the coach's wife. And Tammy says, I can't wait to meet the principal's husband. Yeah, it's a brilliantly written scene and really well acted. They're having one of their arguments, not fights, just a little argument. Coach is a little down in the dumps because he feels like he's got no one in his corner at the moment. And when he says that, it just, yeah, it's a punch in the gut. This was the first football game I ever had to go to. Thanks, Billy. Yeah, that's what happens. You start dating Billy, you got to start going to football games. 
I was supposed to be at state. We like we drove down with Landry and stuff, but I told you guys before I was doing a musical at the same time and they gave me an out. So I left. But I like that Mindy didn't go to the game because she doesn't care about football. So yeah, this was my first time in the stands. And from here on out, in the stands all the time. Yeah. I think you're in every game, right? Welcome to Friday Night Lights. I used to have my Fridays free and I yep. would just meet you guys later, but now I'm there. It was fun though. They were incredibly fun actually. And we would start to see the background actors became such a part of the town and we got to know them and I got to see like friend groups forming and how they would situate themselves. Like a whole other scenes that were happening with them. They were very cool. Yeah. The sound editing, I guess it's the last play of the game, this missed Mm -hmm. touchdown with Saracen. Yeah. It was literally season one reminiscent. What they did is they cut all the background noise out of the scene basically. And all we hear is... (sighs) him running down the field. We hear his Mm -hmm. breath, you know what I mean? And we hear the crunching of pads. Really well done. It it just raises the stakes. Everything's in slow motion. He jumps to get the ball across the goal line. And as he's in the air, about to cross the goal line, he fumbles the ball. And it's technically not a touchdown because he didn't have possession when he crossed the goal line. That's it. Dylan Panthers lose once again to Arnett Mead. Once again. He said, we never win against Arnett Mead. I am going to break the fourth wall and let you guys know a little bit about what happens in post. We almost always have to go in and do a thing called ADR. We go in and there'll be a big screen with our faces on it. And we into a microphone have to say our lines over what we've already said, just because like a mic didn't catch them. I think this was Zach Guilford doing ADR for this scene. And I like, I, I want to watch him do this, just breathing yeah. into a microphone, watching him play football. And just FYI, we don't do ADR for every scene. We do ADR, like if there's a line flubber, you know, the mic doesn't pick a moment mm-hmm. up. Yeah, not for everything. If I do that on a line. That's a great podcast noise. If I do that on a line, somehow hit my mic or something like that, then they'll bring us Mm -hmm. in and have us clean it up a little bit. Can I be honest with you? Mm Mm-hmm. I'm so good at ADR. It's a skill set. I feel like I've gotten better. I used to do Foley work. Foley is, guys, any of the sounds that get put in after this happened in New York, they would hire dancers and we would come in and we would like match footsteps in movies. So I did a lot of like in heels, walking on leaves or on glass to match a scene in a movie. That was fun. Moving forward. Jesus, what are we talking about? (laughs) I feel like Julie has decided she knows what she wants and she's playing long game. I'm just going to say that I love seeing these two together. These two make sense together. Yeah, It's a really beautiful moment too. He comes out of the locker room and it's just that Texas sky. She needed to be in jailhouse for like a little bit Mm -hmm. because she was a punk. Yes. She's grown. She knows what she wants. I enjoy watching her play the long game here. I agree. I hope it works out. Me too. Nothing in the world hits me the way that a smash mama smash scene does. Yeah. Always and forever. She says something along the lines of like, don't worry about this. I'm your mama. That's my job. It's my job to take care of you. And Liz Michael just always crushes it. Always. Every time she's on the show, she just hits it out of the park. It's another one of those moments. One thing I did want to talk about, Stacey, and we haven't talked about this in a while, is Texas being the 12th man. But I love these night scenes that are just scattered throughout this episode. We were shooting these scenes roughly in around like September, maybe early October. Mm -hmm. It's still sweltering in Texas at that time. It's very humid, even at night. And you can like literally see the humidity on camera. All the makeup in the world won't cover the perspiration on an actor's face. And simple things like the sound of cicadas in this scene with Taylor and Minka. You can't replicate that. That's just Texas in September. I love Julie and Matt's walk through town on the way back home from the game and seeing the stoplight blinking. And it just gives you this feel of like small town Texas. Anytime you've driven on like Highway 6 in Texas, Stacy, where, you know, you, you get to go 60 miles an hour and then all of a sudden there'll be a sign that says slow down, 45 mile an hour zone coming up. And you drive through these towns where there's like one blinking light. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? There's usually a cop there waiting to give you a ticket. I think this is why that McCoy house surprised me so much because yes. that's so yes. much more of the Texas I'm used to. And that's the vibe I get to when I think of Dillon, Texas. I think more of like those towns that I drove through that had one or two stoplights. The McCoys have money. That's what that house represents. We thought the Garrity's had money, my Lord. All those little scenes, all those little moments throughout this episode, it's just once again, things that you cannot replicate by shooting in LA. God, can you imagine? That if it had got moved to L.A., mm, there's just, no way. I don't think it would have worked. There's no way. Question. Yes. The Reagans have a pool? Yeah, yeah, they did. By the time we get to the fifth season, the pool in the backyard has been filled up with dirt. Because if you remember correctly, in the fifth season, there's actually scenes in the backyard with me, like, training Matt Loria. Right. I remember our backyard, yeah. like, when it was mine. I didn't know there was a pool there. Yeah. I think when you married me, you probably said, we need to do something about that disgusting pool. 
And so we filled it with dirt. That's how I'm playing. But that pool was never actually filled with water in any of the time that we shot there. There was always like two feet of standing water filled with algae and like rainwater. Oh, disgusting. Like a sludge, like the ooze that the Teenage Ninja Turtles came out of. But I did love that there was a pool back there. It always kind of made me think that maybe there was a time in the boy's life, the Riggins household maybe wasn't so bad. Right. But the parents were there and you guys could splash around in the pool with like water guns. Yeah, right. Oh, that makes me sad. Yeah. But then I think the booze. We, uh-huh. know, we talk about mom having a drinking problem. We know that dad has a drinking problem. We know that dad has a gambling problem and that maybe they were never middle class, but maybe they were like lower middle class, but surviving. And they had this pool. Young, young, young Riggins brother splashing around in a pool. That makes yeah. me happy. I also love that shot that Dean got of us sitting on the edge of the pool. I have a great picture of that moment. And I remember he put the camera up on top of a ladder so it looked like it was a crane shot, basically. So you guys put the copper wire in the pool? No, the copper wire is literally being hid under a couple of tarps by the pool. Oh, okay. I thought you put it in the pool and then covered it. I did want to say that I love the way that this episode ends with Tammy finally playing the role of the coach's wife. We talked about that earlier in the episode, that line, you know what I miss? The coach's wife. That's what we get. Eric and Tammy come home. There's a bunch of for sale signs stuck in the yard again. Basically, they lost one game and this devil town just does not deal with losing. And so the for sale signs are up and Eric's beat down and Tammy's holding his hand. She's got his arm wrapped around his shoulders. Camera pans back as they sit on the edge of the bed and then blackout. And it's just a beautiful ending in general to what I thought was a really, really solid episode. But we're not done yet, folks. We've got D.W. Moffat coming on. And so please stick around. We are thrilled to have D.W. Moffat, Dylan's favorite beer distributor and booster, Joe McCoy, with us on the show today. D.W. has had a ridiculously amazing career, starring in over 100 TV shows, including As the World Turns, Miami Vice, Tales from the Crypt, The Counterfeit Contessa, Chicago Suns, Crossing Jordan, For Your Love, CSI Miami, Cold Case, Without a Trace, Nip Tuck, Skin, The Book of Daniel, Law and Order, Criminal Intent, Brothers and Sisters, Ghost Whisperer, Grey's Anatomy, Lie to Me, Law and Order SVU, Happily Divorced, (laughs) Hot in Cleveland, The First, How to Get Away with Murder, Chicago Med with FNL producing alum, Michael Waxman, and over 100 episodes of the hit ABC family show, Switched at Birth. DW has been seen in such films as Black Widows, Pacific Heights, Falling Down, Stealing Beauty, 13, and of course, the Oscar-winning film, Traffic, directed by Steven Soderbergh, for which DW and the rest of this stellar cast were nominated and won a Screen Actors Guild Award for Best Performance by a Cast in a Motion Picture. This is one of the longer introductions oh, I've had to give on man, this show. I'm taking a nap with when you're done. <laughs> let me know. Yeah. Well, I just want people to know that you've done a little bit more it, brother. than just I'm kidding. Friday I appreciate it. So that's my question for you. Okay. Yeah. Correct me if I'm wrong here, but you were born in Highland Park, Illinois. I was. You were raised in, a, in correct me if I'm wrong on this pronunciation, Wilmette? Wilmette? Well, Wilmette, North Shore of Chicago. Okay. And then you went to junior high in Germany? I went to high school in Germany. My sophomore year, my parents, who were a little forward thinking for suburban Chicagoans in the 1970s, they wanted me, their eldest child, to learn a foreign language. My brother followed suit and they gave me a choice. They were part of a kind of a church group in the suburbs that was very involved in civil rights. And they felt like one of the problems Americans had was that they were not aware of other languages, other cultures. And so all the children from this church group were sent overseas to learn a foreign language. And now some of my compatriots went to Chile, some went to France, some went to Italy. I bafflingly, I think because of my father's World War II experience and his war stories, I had always been intrigued by Germans in Germany. I said, I want to go to Germany. So in 1970, now I'm giving away my age here, which is no mystery. Just go to imdb.com. They found a boarding school in Bavaria. I only had two requirements. One, that it be co-educational because I was not going to go to a high school with a bunch of dudes in Germany. Yes. Yes. And two, that they could accommodate my junior high, sophomore, high school level German, which I knew was not going to cut it at a German high school. Now, interestingly enough, and then I'll shut up about this, the advisors in the school district 
threw a fit. They told my parents that they were thinking of like referring them for like child abuse because they really? were, yeah, because they were sending me from the best public high school system in America at the time, whatever. It's, it's really good. You know, North Shore, Chicago, very good school system. And they were sending me into the unknown. And why would they do that? Cut to, I come back from Germany. I'm speaking fluent German. I'm thinking in German because at that age- wow. Your mind just is, you're a sponge. You're a sponge. I come back and they go, aha, so you're going to come in here and we're going to test you and we're going to show you how you have failed your child. <laughs> After the test, we went in and they were like, well, uh, Donald can graduate now, <laughs> except that I had missed my sophomore year of English. Uh -huh. I was registered for my junior year of English. You've got to have four years of English in Illinois high school to graduate from high school. So apart from taking English classes, according to the test that I took, I was done with American high school after sophomore year, one year in Germany. Wow. Jesus. Are you still fluent in German? Yeah. Yeah. Really? I have to keep it up. I mean, there was a while there back in the day I was getting a German newspaper Mm -hmm. I was getting a German magazine. You know, when you're in Chicago, it ain't hard to find people that speak German. When I got out to California, a little bit more of a challenge. Yeah. But I travel, I travel a lot or, you know, I've run into people. Now, this thing, italki, I mean, it's amazing. It's this app, I-T-A-L-K-I, and I'm not getting paid for this endorsement. <laughs> uh, you find native speakers from a menu of native speakers. It's like 10 bucks an hour. Yeah. And you just... Shoot the shit. You and, just have conversations with people wow. in Germany. Oh, this guy can't believe his luck because it's like, I don't have to teach this guy anything. Yeah, All he yeah. does is send me an article and we sit around and shoot the shit for a while. I also speak Italian, which is not as good as my German. This guy lives in Milan, has for 20 years, yeah. speaks fluent Italian. So I speak 30 minutes German, 30 minutes Italian, cost me 10 bucks. And you got a new buddy. Yeah. Well, not really. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> Listen, I'm kind of a language nut. Like when I was in college, I thought well, I wanted I to talk about that. Yeah. I mean, you I'd say things worked out. You wound up going to Stanford University. You can't yeah. be a dumb dumb to go to Stanford. I'm not a dumb dumb, although you, you check with my wife on that. <laughs> I thought I was going into the Foreign Service. So yeah. I focused heavily on Russian. Ironically, here we are with the Ukraine crisis. And that's literally what I studied in college was wow. Wow. back in the day. When there was still a Soviet Union, there was NATO, and there was a thing called the Warsaw Pact, Yes, which were all of the Eastern European countries in a military alliance overseen by Russia, which is what Vladimir Putin would very much like to reconstitute. So I thought that I was going to be a diplomat. My Russian was very good at the end of my college career. I picked up French along the way, and so I've got a bunch of languages, none of which I used in Austin, by the way. <laughs> no, I don't think Joe McCoy, nobody knew that Joe McCoy had all this knowledge of different oh, languages. No. Listen, no. secretly, maybe Joe McCoy was like a spy working for the CIA. <laughs> I, like yeah, I like that. I like that. Yeah, the biggest huh. spinoff. Yeah. But so <laughs> you studied international relations at Correct. Stanford, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. I want to know about how acting starting for you. I read it on the internet, so it has to be true that maybe partly why you started acting was to meet girls. Well, if you ask any actor who is being honest, it's either to meet girls or boys, depending mm -hmm. on how they roll. But I mean, mm -hmm. that is definitely one of the things. Yes, um, it's definitely one of the things. Yes. So <laughs> after college, my advisor who developed the international relations program at Stanford, he said, you look like you're seven years old. OK, mm -hmm. you just graduated. If you go into the Foreign Service right now, they're going to take one look at you and they are not sending you. To Baghdad. Mm -hmm. They are not sending you to Moscow. They're going to put you in a basement somewhere and file until you look like you can shave. Oh, yeah. God. And so he said, listen, go into business, work your way up. And then when you're a vice president of the bank or an investment bank or wherever, then apply to the Foreign Service, leapfrog G1, G2, G3, G4, leapfrog all of those things. You'll probably look like you can shave at that point. <laughs> And then you'll actually have a foreign service career that won't drive you insane. I went and applied. And like many people, I think still do. I joined a bank training program in Chicago, which is where anyone who's not getting a law degree tends to go if you're thinking about doing business or something like that, because the bank, A, they train you on business stuff. B, most of them will pay for your MBA. 
So I was like, okay, I'm going to go do this. Cut to six months later, I've got my apartment in Chicago and my three-piece suits and I'm going to work. (laughs) And I was really unhappy. I could not believe at 22, this was my life. Yeah. And I was not taking care of myself. And a buddy of mine from high school, who I'm still very dear friends with, said, you know what? I go to this acting class and there's a lot of fun people slash girls. Mm -hmm. Sure. And guess what we do when acting class is over? We go across the street and drink heavily. Yeah. And I was like, (laughs) my people. Sign me up, my people. (laughs) And that could have been the end of the story. Like that could have been my pottery class that gave me some degree of sanity. Yeah. Something happened to me early on in my acting career. And I don't know if you guys have had this experience, but we were doing the repetition exercise in a very early mm-hmm. acting class. Mm-hmm. They're so horrible. Like you have a blue shirt. I have a <laughs> blue shirt. You know, like they're, they're so reserved and they're so like guarded and they're so edited, which is totally the opposite of the exercise. Mm-hmm. And this guy, he thought he was like a little Mr. Man. Like he was mm-hmm. like, be like a, like a Vinnie Barbarino. He gets up there and, and we're partners and he goes, Hey man, like your belt. And I looked at him and I said, you're a f-. And the class exploded <laughs> because it was the first time someone had said something brutally honest Yeah, within the exercise. And so for our listeners at home, the the repetition exercise is a concept that was created by a guy named Sanford Meisner, who's a famous acting teacher. And the whole entire point of it is to get you out of your head, to literally just start reacting to the other character or the other person that you're working across from. And you're supposed to repeat what the other person says. I should have said, I have a cool belt or whatever he said. Yeah. Now in the repetition exercises, if I go... I like your belt. You like my belt. I like your belt. You like my belt. You like my belt. You're driving me crazy. I'm driving you crazy. You're driving me crazy. Mm -hmm. Like you're Mm -hmm. supposed to shift the dialogue when it organically feels right. Yeah. I had broken every rule by shifting the dialogue from the first sentence, but it was so true. And everyone in the class thought he was a. Yeah. The room exploded. I had, for lack of a better term, it was like a spiritual experience when that happened because I literally felt for the first time, almost in my life, that I was home, that Mm -hmm. I had arrived at a place where I could be for the rest of my life, which was this idea of an actor as a truth teller. We've lost this a lot with the social media and the we're branding ourselves, I'm branding, and this is my brand. The joy of acting for me as an actor goes back to, and I don't mean to be all highfalutin about this. (laughs) Oh, I love it. But a shamanic energy, when you feel that you have connected to your character and you are bringing the story in its rawest, truest way, the truth has to be there. Yes. Mm -hmm. And Sandy Meisner was very big on not editing yourself. And it's one of the things as a culture, we need to edit ourselves. As people, we need to edit ourselves. But as an actor, it's the worst thing you can do. Going back to that class I was telling you guys, and we can get into that later on, but like I teach a class called Directing the Actor, where I teach directors how to talk to actors, which as you both know, most directors don't know how to do it. Mm -mm. At best, they give you a result that makes sense. Yeah. It's always fun as an actor when you get a director who was an actor or, yeah, or who, who is an actor. The best, yeah. Which is why we loved Peter Berg so much. Mm-hmm. You know? mm-hmm. Because he was an actor to start yeah. with. He knows I what know our I'm process all is. over the place. I tell my students my only goal in this class, yes, I will give you tools how to talk to an actor. But my real goal is to give you a truth detector so that when you see an honest performance, you feel it. Yeah, that is something you cannot get on a Zoom call, you know, during the pandemic. So I love being back in the room because when that happens between two actors, like you guys have felt it on stage, you felt it in the small theater, you can even feel it in a big theater. Yeah. When that moment is there of truth, you could cut the atmosphere with a knife. Electric. Because it's, it's there. You just mentioned theater and it was something that I wanted to bring up as well, <laughs> is that you started out working as an investment banker. How quickly after that investment banker job, because we already discussed earlier your film and television credits. This is kind of ridiculous, guys. For those of you who don't know much about theater, I mean, the run that you had in the 80s is kind of insane. You started in The Real Thing by Tom Stopper. Then you went on to do Boys of Winter and Contact, not to mention 
you were also in the original cast of Larry Kramer's The Normal Heart. My question to you, how does an investment baker from Wilmot, Illinois, end up in two of the most seminal plays in the history, literally, of, of the English-speaking language? I mean, both of them are in the top 100 plays of everybody's list. I so, mean, Normal so Heart and The Real Thing. I have to say that luck has a lot to do with our careers here in this yes. business. I was lucky enough to be part of a theater movement and a time in theater in Chicago that may never be replicated. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's not just because of the talent pool, because Chicago continues to spit out really good actors. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. In 1979, okay, my girlfriend at the time was really good friends with an actress named Glenn Headley, who's unfortunately mm -hmm. passed away, but was a brilliant actress and who I had been in a company with in 78 when I first quit the bank to become an actor. Glenn's boyfriend was a guy named John Malkovich. Mm -hmm. Heard of him. And we used to hang out together and he would go, well, we've got a little theater company up in Highland Park. You should just start your own company, man. You're a smart guy. You were a banker. Just start your own company because you don't want to audition for these creeps. Start your theater company. So Remains Theater, my company, and Steppenwolf Theater, mm -hmm. starting in 1980, in order to please only ourselves produced some of the most magical theater I've ever seen. Yeah. And this is important. There was no end game. No. There was no, I'm doing this so that agents will come see me so that I'll have a time in Hollywood. We were literally doing it because we loved doing yeah. it. We didn't know any better. And Steppenwolf, guys, that was John Malkovich's company, yeah. or is still John yeah, Malkovich's yeah. company. Uh, yeah. And Gary yeah. Sinise, so, and I mean, yeah. just a yeah. host of... It's me, Gary Cole, William Peterson, John Malkovich, Terry Kinney, Gary Sinise, Laurie Metcalf, Joan Allen. Tracy mm -hmm. Letts. Amy Morton, Natalie West. It was a time when there was all of that talent, but there was zero, zero outside picking us apart energies. We were ensembles. We would crossbreed. I would be in a Steppenwolf show. They would be in a Remain show, all oh, of that wow. stuff. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't know if you know this, but I started a theater company in Dallas oh, in cool, 2004. Cool. And we literally went on Steppenwolf's website, mm -hmm. stole their bylaws, and <laughs> tweaked them for ourselves. But it's an ensemble-based theater company in Dallas called Second Thought Theater. We've now been around for almost 20 years. You guys uh, are doing good. 20 years is a really good run. Just to stay in the black for 20 years is a good thing. Yeah. But that's the whole entire purpose of it was... And they would be happy that you stole all that stuff. Yeah. Um, and we figured as much. So in 82, Steppenwolf did a really nice production of Sam Shepard's True West. A producer who was in Chicago saw the production and said, I want to take this to New York. And John was like, and now his wife, Glenn Headley, said, you're taking this to New York. So they take it to New York. We're doing our thing. I'm sitting in the bar that we all hung out in. And someone walks in and throws down a copy of the New York Times. The review says, I have seen the face of the American theater. Yeah. It is currently on stage at the Circle Rep West in the Steppenwolf production of True West. Oh and my let me God. tell you something, the floodgates open. Yeah. You were from Chicago and from an ensemble theater company, and you got off the Greyhound bus at Times Square. <laughs> there were agents tackling you to sign wow. you, much to the chagrin of many New Yorkers. And in fact, Kevin Bacon is so funny. Imagine. Whenever you go, oh, yeah, where are you from? She goes, oh, fucking Chicago, man. <laughs> <laughs> I can't believe this shit. You, they gave you a platter. They gave you a cruiser. So John then takes another great production that we had done in Chicago called Balm and Gilead. I love Balm and Gilead. To New York. I had done it in Chicago. He asked me to come to New York. And then I auditioned for The Real Thing, got that. You're going to love this. And then I'll shut up about this. No, I love it. During The Real Thing, my agent says, hey, there's this script. The character's gay. Is that a problem? And I'm like, no, like, no. But this is a great story. By the way, the script that I was sent for the real thing looked like a phone book. It was like mm -hmm. 400 pages long. It was insane. It was a great love story. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, I can do this. I'm a man in love who dies. It's great. I love this. You mean for Normal Heart? Normal, for normal Heart. heart. Yes. Yeah. So I'm at Odeon, which was a big sort of dinner place in the 80s, a big thing. And I'm there. And there's an actor friend of mine who was kind of established. And he said, what do you do? What's up, man? I said, I'm doing the real thing on Broadway. He's like, are you kidding me? Oh, man. man. So what else? Well, I'm auditioning for this play at the public. And he goes, not the gay play. Okay. Yes. And I said, yeah, the gay play. He goes, oh, man, you can't do that. Mm. I said, what are you talking about? He goes, dude, 
You just got to town. They're all going to th- literally, this is the quote. They're all going to think you're light in your loafers. Hmm. And I was like, yeah, well, I'm still going to audition for it because it's a great. Yeah. That actor played my part in the London production after the show was a hit. Yeah. Huh. Okay. So there you go. But I had no idea that play was going to be what that play became. When did you know how special it was? And for our listeners at home that don't know what The Normal Heart is about, The Normal Heart is basically the first play that tackled the AIDS issue in the 80s and brought it to light. There were other plays that referenced the plague, but yeah. they danced around it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Normal heart was just open heart surgery, like in your living room, on the dining room table, like full on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I knew that what I had done was important when the preview audiences came. And Joe Papp loved that play, by the way. He loved that play. The first theater we were in was one upstairs. And the way it was configured was like a football field with bleachers at either end zone. And there was Mm -hmm. nobody in between. So you would play between these 75 and 75 people. And the curtain call, half of the cast would line up in front of the one bleacher, and then we'd walk across and we'd line up to the other bleacher. Well, the previews have sold out. The lights come up, first or second preview. First of all, the weeping that you would hear in the blackout was unbelievable. Yeah. And then the lights came up, and there in the first row, second row, you see all these men weeping with these huge lesions on their faces oh god heavy heavy. it particularly hit the theater community extra hard because there is such a huge population of homosexual men in the theater community i had a good friend of mine a guy named stephen petty who went to college with me stephen was like 33 years old and we always thought it was really weird because stephen was back there from new york to get his undergrad degree and i was 18 i'm like why is this 33 year old guy here taking the same classes that I am. Well, turns out Stephen had started a gay rights association at Baylor University, a Christian school, and he got kicked out because of that. He moved off to New York, worked consistently in theater in New York for years and years and years. Great actor. Came back to Waco, Texas. We're like, why the hell is this guy back here? Turns out Stephen had contracted the virus. Stephen had AIDS and his dying wish was literally to finish his undergrad degree. Wow. He got his degree and literally four months after that, he died. But I remember a point in time when we were sitting there, I was in his apartment and I said, is this your theater company back in New York? And he said, yeah. And there was a picture of about 40 people. And he said, he's dead. He's dead. He's yeah. dead. He's dead. He's dead. He's dead. He's dead. There were literally three people in the whole entire picture that were still living. One of them was Stephen, who passed away about seven months later. Well, over half of the original cast of Normal Heart succumbed to the plague within a couple of years. And that's why that play was so important at the time, because I don't think people in middle America knew how this was affecting. No. Because it was a gay virus. It had nothing to do with them. And people don't also don't realize Larry, the playwright, was much hated Mm -hmm. in the gay community because they thought he was telling them how they should live their lives. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That he was disseminating a gay bashing message by telling Mm -hmm. them that they couldn't go to bathhouses, that they had to be careful. whereas. It was like, no, I finally come out. I get to live the life that I want to live. I get to do all these things that I've always wanted to do. They felt Larry was preaching to them and being punitive. Yeah, It wasn't only the dude in the Odeon who told me to be careful. The only friend I had in New York City who I knew was gay was a kid I grew up with when I lived in Bronxville, New York for a couple of years when I was a kid. He said, Larry Kramer, you stay a mile away from that. No, You know, like, so I was getting it from both ends. Yeah. And I'm like, guys, I just want to do a good play. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, right. And it's a time you don't know that it's going to become this iconic thing that's going to coming through theater schools. It's like the real thing and normal heart. Everyone in college is doing a scene from it. These are, and we're all idolizing companies like Steppenwolf. But that's mm-hmm. the thing is at the time as you're living it, you don't know that this is this no. thing or that it's going to be no. this thing that no. kids in my generation were like, this is amazing. You know, I look back on the theater times in Chicago and the purity of what we were doing. Yeah. And it's really hard. It's really hard to instill that in young filmmakers and young actors because they've all got their eye on the prize. You know, they all see kids on Stranger Things or whatever, Disney shows or whatever, making a lot of money. Yeah. I'm sorry to say it, but it's like corrupting. 
And by the way, there are a lot of those kids on those shows that don't mature into very good actors. No. And they have no training. They started the whole thing just to get on a show and make a paycheck. And that is not an avenue to a good artistry. I've always been very thankful that whatever success I've had in this business came when I was a little bit older. Friday Night Lights was my first big gig. Yeah. And it happened when I was 30. But up until that time, I was doing theater. And like none of us go into the theater to make money. That's no. <laughs> it's because we love it. That's but not where the money is. Because you love it. And yeah. that's I, that's still to this day. I mean, I was saying to you that I mentor some kids. And that's the first thing I say is you got to make sure you love this. And when yeah. I say love this, I mean, it's got to be to the level of like an addiction love it. Yeah, because um, it's hard. Yeah, it's a difficult yeah. business, but it's also so rewarding. And I can't imagine doing anything else with my life. I love this. I do think that back in the day, like in the 40s and the 50s, I'll just start there as going back to yeah. the- too far is too weird. But the James Deans, the Dennis Hoppers, the Marlon Brandos, mm-hmm. they all trained, man. They took a deep dive in you know, the Playhouse or Meisner or whoever. Yeah. They trained. Yes. They trained. And that, that is something that is very different nowadays. Yes. You're 100% right about that. Here's a great segue. Without theater training, I would say that Linda Lowy, who cast Friday Night Lights, she was looking for people with theater chops. And Linda Lowy is married to Jeff Perry, who's also a member of Steppenwolf. So like it all comes full circle. But you know, the way Pete shot that without rehearsal, and we can get into this, and the way that two takes moving on, Mm -hmm. if you didn't have that ability to bring it like you do when you walk out on a stage. Yeah. It was going to be a hard road for you on that show. When I got down to Austin the first day, the AD says, now listen, we have to have an orientation talk about how we shoot this show. And I'm like, dude, I've done this. Like, okay, I'm, I get it. I know what's going on. He says, no, you have no idea what's going on. And it might've been Waxman, but he says, we do two takes. We don't have marks. We don't have rehearsal. And after the second take, we move on. Yeah. And that is gospel Bible, the way we do it. And I'm like, wait a second, wait a second. What do you mean you have two takes and you move on? He goes, we have three cameras. We do two takes. If you don't like your first take, you better get it right in the second (laughs) take. Because if you don't get it right, then you're not going to get it. And I'm I'm thinking in my mind, this is a bunch of like, oh, scare the new actor. So he learns his lines tonight. Yeah. Cut to my first day was with Kyle in his office. Mm -hmm. That was your first scene? My first scene. Where Is it I, the one where you try to bribe them with yes, cigars? Yeah, with the cigars. Okay. Yeah. And it's a long speech. And it's yeah. not only my speech is long, but Kyle's retort speeches are long. Mm-hmm. Like three or four pages. You know, and Jeffrey Reiner was directing. And he's like, okay, are you guys ready? Okay, let's, okay, roll. And I'm like, oh, they're really serious. There are There is no rehearsal. Okay. No rehearsal. No last yeah. looks. No yeah. nothing. Yeah, no nothing. So... We're shooting and I get in there and the scene's going along. And, you know, there's three cameras, those guys on the easy rigs, and they're just like walking around like, I'm like, oh, this is weird. But I just, you know, I keep doing it. And then about halfway into the scene, I go up like I'm completely dry, partially because I've realized Kyle is not going to say any of his line. So I had this huge speech. Then he has a demi huge speech which motivates my second huge. (laughs) So I finish my first speech and literally, this is what Kyle does. He Uh just stares at you and nods. Yeah. Uh uh That's his thing. I can do that with a look. Yeah. Yeah. Uh And he can. (laughs) Uh So then I launch into my now unmotivated second speech Mm -hmm. that I have to sort of find a handle for to motivate it. And I'm halfway through it and I go up. So I just go line, line, and I finally scream out, can somebody please give me the line? Because I don't know where the I am in this scene. And Reiner, I hear it. It's like someone calling at you from the other end of Grand Central Station. He yeah. goes, you're doing great. <laughs> Just keep talking. It's great. And Kyle goes, oh, yeah, it's great, man. Just keep going. (laughs) And so I just sort of made some shit up. Yes. And then stumbled back into the text, kind of. Because Kyle, I think he said of his seven speeches in that scene, he maybe did one speech as written. 
Yeah. And the rest of them were like paraphrasing or just literally going, uh-huh, uh-huh. Mm-hmm. That was baptism by fire. You got thrown into the fire. Yeah. Very first. Yeah. My first day, we improv the scene first, which was nerve wracking because I'm like, you, you want me to, what? He's like, yeah, mm-hmm. I mean, we're going to shoot this other scene, the scene that we've got scheduled later. But for right now, I just wanted to improv a scene. Yeah. Pete says, and I'm like, I don't, I mean, my heart started. Boom, 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 yeah. And I could yeah. feel a trickle of sweat coming there because I wasn't wearing a shirt in the scene. And there's a trickle of sweat coming down the side of my ribs and I could feel it come. Oh, it was awful. I still think that the way Pete shot that show should mm-hmm. be a template for other shows, especially you know, television. I really think that if I ever had the good grace to get a show on the air, I would shoot that way. It's not perfect for every single show, obviously, but I mean, especially with a lot of these cop dramas that are on there, it's like, why not? It's grittier. It's, it's so realer. It's, I see the amount of time. Yeah, that we spent setting on, up lights. Well, on, uh, but last looks, usually so absurd. But, you know, I got to give it to the ladies, including Connie, mm-hmm. because Connie was not a youngster when she shot that. I've said this ad nauseum on our show. It's like you have no clue how much better looking in real life most of these people are because the show didn't do anyone any favors in terms of it, it vanity. It specifically made us look a little bit worse. But yeah, you couldn't have yeah. any vanity on that show, which I also loved. But let's go back a tiny little bit. How did you come to Friday Night Lights? Was this a straight offer? Did you go in with Linda Lowy? No, Linda, who's a fan, mm-hmm. but she was like, look, this is a big part. Mm-hmm. And yeah. they need to see you on tape. I said, oh, that's great. Um, you know yeah. me. I'll go read for Linda for anything. anything. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And I came in and I said, I can do this with an accent, Linda, or not. And she said, eh, no accent. If you get the part and they want an accent, you can put it on later. So I came in, ironically, laid it down. And she was like this. That's great. Yeah. <laughs> that was it. I did it one awesome. time. And then got it, was I think booked for three or four episodes. Mm-hmm. And get down there and it's going well. And so they've asked me to do three or four more. Mm -hmm. But as you know, like they rewarded our excellence by cutting the budget and making us shoot more pages in a shorter amount of time. So there was no extra money for me to to now commit to do what's almost like a series regular because I've now been asked to do like almost all of the episodes of season three. You did 20. I did 20 or 19 or something. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, And and we only had, I think, 26 episodes. So you did 20 out of 26. Yeah. Of those two seasons, right? Yeah. Yeah. There are also people that were doing less than that and were series regulars. Yeah. And so I say to my manager, well, they've got to offer me more money or we have to pass, right? She goes, absolutely. Yeah, we're going to pass. Yeah. 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 So I'm flying home from Austin and I feel this and it's Jeff Reiner. Mm -hmm. He goes, look, I get it, man. I get it. It's affecting everybody, the economics on this show. But I'm going to tell you one thing and I'm not bullshitting you. If you continue to do this show, you will be very happy with what is being written for you. Yeah. It is a huge arc on this show. And you know what? He got me because at the end of the day, what more do you want? Do you know what that is? That goes back to your beginning roots about why you started doing theater in the first place. And Jeffrey got you right in that storytelling truth nugget. Yeah. Look, I mean, all of us had to deal with that on a regular basis on Friday Night Lights. I mean, for the first two years of that show, I wasn't on contract. For the third season of the show, I was finally put on contract, but I was never a series regular. I wound up doing 65 out of 76 episodes or something. But boy, do you love those residuals, my friend. I love the residuals. And I love the fact that I got, I mean, the opportunity that I got to have on this show was like nothing else. And I remember my buddy Paul and I having a discussion about it. My buddy Paul's a a Chicago guy as well. And his first big gig, Paul Edelstein, who you probably know or at least worked with at some point. But Paul and I had a long conversation. I said, man, I'm getting screwed. They're not paying me anything. And he said, how quickly do you think you could find something like this if you quit the show tomorrow? He said, do you you think you could find something that would be comparable to this artistically in a month? And I said, no. He goes, two months? No. He goes, then they got you by the short hairs, man. Yeah. <laughs> so just yeah. take it on the chin and then yeah. on the next one, hopefully you'll get paid. You know, exactly. exactly. That's kind of what happened on this. But I don't regret it to this day. I don't regret it. I'm glad that it worked out, that my manager was cool enough to let me keep doing it. I'm very proud of this. I get booked on Friday Night Lights for three episodes. Mm-hmm. I do 20. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I get booked for three episodes on Chicago Med. I do 20. Yep. I get booked for three episodes on this Fox show, Monarch first season. Yeah. I wind up doing seven. I didn't know that. See on your IMDb, it still only says that you got one credit on there. Monarch's a good one, man. Like again, I'm kind of the Joe McCoy guy. And so I'm like, bring it on. 
DW, as amazing as your career has been up till Friday Night Lights, you got to think that because of the performance that you gave on Friday Night Lights, that opened a lot of doors for you. I am under no illusion that that is true. Like yeah. that is absolutely true. I know yeah. for a fact that my performance on Friday Night Lights changed how the town looked at me, mm -hmm. changed how the town was like, oh, that guy, I remember him. Wow, he's he is good. Yeah. yeah, I thought he was good. And then now I've realized he is good. So Switched at Birth, the show that I did on ABC mm -hmm. Family, 103 episodes. I walked in that room and the first thing the showrunner said to me was, I am a huge Friday Night Lights fan. I'm a little scared yeah. of being in the room with Joe McCoy right now. <laughs> Friday Night Lights changed my life in Hollywood because it's hard enough to repackage yourself for people. Yeah. It's much better when something else repackages you yeah. and goes, look, Derek, I always thought Derek was really good, but oh my God, look at him in this. Mm -hmm. Everyone in town is like talking about the show and they still talk about it. Still show. talk about it. People still stop me in airports. When Jeffrey did tell you you're gonna like your story coming up, how much did you know about the McCoys and what was gonna happen? I never knew, for instance, that there was gonna be that scene in the Applebee's parking lot, which mm -hmm. that's a whole other story because Waxman directed that episode. Yeah. And I was like, so Michael, like it says in the script that I beat him up. I heard that that, I mean, through different channels, that that scene got really, really intense in the Applebee's parking lot. Well, yeah, because it says, I beat him up. Mm -hmm. I said, Michael, what do you want to do? He goes, beat him up. And I was like, Michael, what do you mean? He goes, pop him. I don't know, whatever. Like, whatever happens, like, go for it. JD, Jeremy. Jeremy's like, yeah, man, man. Just nail me, man. Nail me. Absolutely. You. That's a good Jeremy impression. That's, yeah. that's a, always, a very 18-year-old hey, mentality, yeah. too. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> just, just nail me, man. It'd be great. Just nail me. <laughs> I think Waxman was like, just, you know, just don't make him lose a tooth, but you yeah. know, just hit him. That's all real, man. There's no sound effects there. I wow. wailed on that kid. <laughs> and Kyle comes running over during the first take, you know, the rain machine. And, you know, yeah. Kyle's yeah. one that drags me off of him. And I was wailing on him. And Kyle is literally on my back in my ear going, what are you doing? What are you doing? <laughs> but it plays. It plays. Yeah. We're going to have to let you go. But thank sure. you so much. For oh, my pleasure, guys. Love talking to you. Guys, that is it for season three, episode three. But please join us next time for season three, episode four, titled Hello, Goodbye. But until then, clear eyes. Full hearts. Can't lose. Clear Eyes, Full Hearts is a podcast presentation of Cadence 13 in association with Black Barrel Media and Ritual Productions. Executive producers are Stacey Oristano and Derek Phillips, Chris and Mandy Wimmer for Black Barrel Media, and Steve Walters for Ritual Productions. Our producer is Miranda Parham. Send your questions to clearEyesFullHeartsPod at gmail.com. Find us on social media. I'm Stacey Oristano on Twitter and Instagram. And I'm at Derek Phillips on Twitter and underscore Derek Phillips on Instagram. And check out our websites, ClearEyesFullHeartsPod.com, Cadence13.com, and BlackBarrelMedia.com. Thank you guys for listening, and we'll see you next week.